Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Right. <laughs> well, on that, Adam, have we ever covered a nil-nil before? We've never covered a nil-nil before because how the f did you cover a nil-nil? Well, there we go. Hello everyone, Adam Monk here from 442 and I'm about to try and dissect the worst game of football I have ever watched. Like, so knockout games in high state competitions are always going to be cagey, especially as you get, you get later into the tournament, you know, and the quality of opposition just gets higher and higher and higher. Teams are going to be a bit more conservative and not want to lose the game. That's very understandable, but there was a distinct lack of attacking quality in this game and also positional quality as well. So let me just start by showing you what the formations should have looked like. And it is something like this. So here you have Portugal in a sort of 4-3-3 shape with Bruno Fernandes playing off the sort of eight position and he can drift into number 10 if need be and then France on the other hand was sort of in a more narrow diamond shape with Mbappe and Colo Mouani up front now let me know that is how it should have looked right with that said now let's hop over to the average positions this is Portugal's and to be honest I don't really know what to call that it's kind of a back three Nuno Mendes playing almost as a left midfielder Cristiano Ronaldo well we'll get on to him later but he's almost operating as a midfielder stroke winger and João Cancelo as well pushed very high and wide on the right hand side as well so you kind of had a kind of back three that's you know it was a bit of a mess and to exemplify that let's flip over to France Again, very disjointed, very cagey, and just look how deep William Saliba is on average compared to the other defensive players in his team. It is just absolutely all over the place. Now that shape is all well and good if you have a game plan and you're able to execute it. And both teams kind of did have a game plan that was to hit each other on the break, of course, but neither team had the quality to get the job done. And if there's one stat to exemplify that that still rings true after full time in this game, it's the fact that France haven't scored an open play goal all tournament. So like I just said, both teams game plan was to sucker punch each other and hit each other on the break, whether that's from a set piece or in open play. Now Portugal were able to do this slightly more efficiently, which I'll come on to in a minute. But when France were able to do it, they just simply didn't have the quality or decision making in the final third to execute what they wanted to do. So I'll show you with a clip now. So here Portugal have a corner and in a rather counterintuitive way, this is exactly what France wanted them to have in the first half. Portugal swing it in and Saliba clears France's lines. And the way that France actually break within their own half is really, really impressive here. So he's initially headed out to Griezmann here and three Portugal players are pressing him immediately, but he beats the press superbly. And then likewise, another three Portuguese players pressing, but it's immediately transitioned out wide to Theo Hernandez. And then France are on the break. And it's a very, very impressive drive by Theo Hernandez. France have a lot of this, the physical capability to carry the ball up the pitch. But when it's come to the decision-making this tournament, exemplified by the fact that that they just haven't scored a goal in open play. I mean, look at this decision making. Woeful. Like, I honestly could not even tell you who that pass is supposed to be to. Now, in Portugal's case, when they broke, there was actually, even though they were still pretty crap at it, there was still a little bit of a method to the madness. And if you go and look at Ronaldo's heat map, you can see here that Homelando is hugging the width of the pitch very, very much so. And he's not really playing as that sort of focal point striker that you'd expect him to be. And what Portugal would do is this. If any of these midfields in the middle of the park or the defence picked up the ball for Portugal, Cristiano Ronaldo would go out wide. He'd usually occupy a defender with him. And then Bernardo Silva would drift into this inside pocket and receive the ball and knock it down to either Ronaldo or Leal. And then Portugal would have a foothold in France's final third. And that is what they kind of rinsed and repeated. And here is a prime example of it. Pepe's on the ball here, who we'll come on to later. He had an amazing game considering his age. And Portugal is simply playing keep ball at this juncture and they're trying to invite pressure from France, but it's not really coming. France is sitting off and allowing them to have the ball. So he's popped out to Cancelo and look at this. You can see, you can see his eyes, his eyeball in the movement that he's expecting. He sees Bernardo drift inside and Ronaldo outside. It creates that switch and look at the pass he executes. Boom, and then you have an unmarked Bernardo right in that pocket in the number 10 position, ready to head it out wide to a vacant Cristiano Ronaldo and then Portugal can get the ball up the pitch that way and that worked consistently throughout the game for them. And then on to the second half, for large parts it was just more of the same, disjointed shape, no real cutting edge and I only I think the only real reason that Portugal will feel short changed in this game is they had slightly more technical players and were able just on talent alone to be slightly more incisive when they did get the ball in certain areas of the pitch. You can see here, this is early in the second half. Like I honestly, for, for the life of me, I could not really tell you what this shape is. All I could tell you is there's seven bodies leaning towards the left side of the pitch. But if you pat that many bodies onto one side of the pitch, 
you best do something with it. And boy do they, but one thing I would say here, like the amount of time that Bettini is allowed to have on the ball without any French midfielders wanting to press him. Like this guy's in the middle of the park here, you're trying to make this a fight, you're trying to make it dogged. And France were just so passive at times. You can just see how like this this kind of half arse press from Kola Moani is just so easily beaten with a quick triangle between Bruno Pepe and Nuno Mendes. But then it's popped back into Bruno and then just look at Kola Moani, he just simply does not track his runner. And then from those very, very simplistic triangle sequences, you then have a two-on-one, Rafa Liao and Nuno Mendes on Jules Koundé, and that, of course, spells danger. And it is a great ball from Bruno and just sheer athleticism from Nuno Mendes that allows him to get in behind Jules Koundé, and then he wants to win a penalty, and he can't. But Portugal got in behind on that occasion from intricate play, and it was few and far between during this match. And then, again, just to typify how dross this game was in the full 90 minutes, how did France get their best chance of the game? Well, again, it was from overall poor play with one very, very, very fleeting moment of quality between Koundé and Kola Mouani, but just look at this breakaway from France. The ball's won by, of course, N'Golo Kante, and he's able to pop it into Griezmann, and he's got acres of the pitch to pick out Kola Mouani, and just look at the execution of the pass. Shocking, like absolutely shocking. You should be able to hit that. If you're Antoine Griezmann, you should be able to hit that on a sixpence and France should have been away and Mbappe should have been in. That should have been the goal moment. Having said that though, the individual quality of Kola Mouani, which is something that France have heavily just relied on this tournament with him and Mbappe, is able to drive him up the pitch and he plays a very, very neat one too with Jules Koundé, and it is, to be honest, an amazing block from Ruben Diaz that prevents France from opening the scoring. But overall, honestly, in an attacking sense, I'd say it was the worst game of the tournament, and one of the lowest quality games of the tournament as well, in terms of action inside the 18-yard box. Thank you, Sean. I would love one. I would absolutely, I'm, I'm vitally need actually one. Sponsored. The channel is sponsored. I, I, I didn't ask for three, but... Well, I think I've just had a refresh your Hmm. I just did, yeah. <laughs> but one of the reasons that... No, I can't talk like that. <laughs> now, one of the reasons that that game was so dismal in the 18-yard box was, of course, this man. Now, very slowly, I'm just going to read out the substitutions which Roberto Martinez decided to make in this game. Nelson Semedo came on for João Cancelo. Francisco Conceição came on for Bruno Fernandes. Ruben Neves came on for João Pelinha. João Felix came on for Rafael Liao. And finally, Matias Nunes came on for Vitinha. So, Roberto Martinez, I am asking you this question. Why have you made these five subs when there is a man on your pitch who has just withdrawn his state pension? It is absolutely ridiculous. He just couldn't help himself, could he? Oh, and it hit the wall. And then if I couldn't hammer the point home any further, I mean, tactics aside, just look at this. It's amazing, amazing individual wing play from Bernardo Silva in extra time at this point as well. And in fairness to Ronaldo, it is absolutely fantastic striker's movement. He drops off the shoulder of Upa Meccano, he drops deep, and I'd say for a player of Cristiano Ronaldo's supposed quality, he should be scoring this. Then finally, onto the penalty shootouts, which of course decided the game. Now, me and Adam were watching it, and we heard Rio Ferdinand say that penalties are a lottery, and, well, we disagree, and we really disagree, because I actually, um, rather sadly, timed the run-up length of each player, because Adam had a theory. And that theory is one that proved to actually be true as well, and it's simply put, if you wait longer when the whistle has been blown, and, you, you know, you take more time, you <laughs> breathe, you know, you set yourself up, you pick your spot, you just relax, you're more likely to score. And this actually paid dividends and turned out to be right. The one penalty in the shootout that was missed was by Zhao Felix. And it was also the second quickest penalty to be taken from the whistle going to the ball being kicked in the whole shootout. And also, to be honest, from when the whistle was blown to when he actually started stepping up to take it, there was basically milliseconds. He did it straight on the whistle, so he spent absolutely no time setting himself up. And consequently, he missed. Then on the flip side, what was the longest penalty from whistle to ball being kicked in the shootout, you ask? Well, it was Theo Hernandez's winning one. I counted 7.17 seconds from when the whistle went to when the ball was kicked. And you can see here, he's calm, he's composed, he takes his time. It's a slow-ish run up, but you just know that he's calculated and thought about it before the ball has been kicked. And then he sends the keeper the wrong Way. And I think this is something that's very, very underestimated. Everyone talks about how penalties are, you know, psychological warfare, and they really, really are. So you've got to take advantage of that psychology. You've got to get on top of yourself in a way, rather than just instinctively going up. I kind of get that in a way, like if you pick your spot, okay, I'm going to hit it, bang, and just do it. But that's all a little bit erratic. And I think if you're one of those players, you can sort of get in your own head, not in that way, you know, just compose yourself, calm down, take your time. You are more likely to score 
And I think, Adam, your theory has proved correct. He's had, he's had it in, he can't hear me. Science! There you go. Anyway, yes, that was a very, very dismal game. Portugal are out, Homelander is going home now, and it is currently quarter past 12, so, uh, so I'm gonna go to bed. Don't forget to subscribe, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video. We're gonna be covering every single video now from, well, from now till the end of the tournament. So whatever team you're supporting, if they're still in it, or if they're not and you're just enjoying the football, then stay tuned, because there'll be more coming. And if you're more of a magazine kind of person, then we got a new brand spanking edition of the mag. This one is about Pep's disciples. So you got Arteta, Xabi Alonso, Arna Slot, Vincent Company, Maresca. You could also have Ten Hag, Xavi. I could go on, I could go on. I really like Pep, I support Six. Da, 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 but buy it. Anyway, guys, yes, hope you've enjoyed the video. I've been Adam Monk, uh, at underscore Adam Monk on socials. If you want to check me out or follow me, well, uh, yeah, that's what you do. Oh, well, you could just check me out and go, oh, I don't want to follow that. You can, you can do what you want. Just If you want to search it, if you want to put it in the search bar, it's at underscore Adam Monk. Um, anyway, enjoy the rest of the Euros and the rest of your weekend. I will see you very, very soon. Goodbye.